All right, hi everybody. So it looks like everyone's shuffling in, got the presentation working. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you guys are all staying safe and that you're home doing okay. Um, welcome to our presentation tonight um, on how high schoolers can make the most of time spent social distancing while they're home from school. Um, so just some short introductions. So my name is Kayla Kasica. I am a graduate coach here with Ingenious Prep, uh, and I'm also the host of our podcast inside the admissions office. Um, I live in, I'm from a small town in Michigan, Heartland, Michigan, uh, and I went to school at the University of Michigan where I studied communication studies and psychology. Uh, and I'm joined here today with Erica Curtis, our former admissions officer. Uh, Erica, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, hi everyone, I'm Erica Curtis. I'm a FAO or former admissions officer at Ingenious Prep. Um, I formerly was an admissions evaluator at Brown University and read applications for them. Um, in addition, I've also worked as associate director of college counseling and director of college counseling um, at a number of independent high schools in Maryland, where I live, um, and I've worked with Ingenious Prep for the last uh, three years, um, working with our students to help them, you know, learn how to best advocate for themselves in the admissions process. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, Erica. I'm hoping we can give people a lot of great advice today, um, and I hope you're doing well and staying healthy, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we're going to go over today. So first, we're just going to start with a short introduction of who we are and what we do. Um, and just a reminder that at the end, as always, we're going to do a short Q&A. So as we go, be thinking of your questions, putting them in the chat box, and I'll make sure to note them for later. So who is Ingenious Prep? So we have a team of over 150 former admissions officers from top schools like Erica. Um, so these are former admissions officers like Susan Shiflett from Yale, Zach Harris from Johns Hopkins, and Danielle McColgan from NYU, just to name a few. Uh, and these are the counselors that work with our students to really help them through the application process and to craft their applications. We also have our team of over 75 graduate coaches. So these are graduates of top schools. These are trained writers and editors that also work with our students. So these are people like James Imers from Yale, Shannon Bedingfield from Yale as well, and Amanda Gillum from Columbia and Dartmouth, just to name a few. And finally on our team, we have a large network of professors, scholars, and researchers. And these are people that work with our students through our program called Academic Mentorship, which we'll actually talk about later. Uh, so these are people like Kaya Stern from Harvard, Robert Minervini from Stanford, and Sandra Lacau from Yale. Um, and these are people that work with our students on research projects, on classes. And like I said, we will be talking about that later. So all of these counselors together, and especially our former admissions officers, work together to make a cutting edge curriculum built from their experiences of actually working in the admissions office. So they have created a systematic and operational curriculum so a curriculum that we use across all of our students that is consistent, um, but it's also very school specific. We have um, former admissions officers from every top 30 university, and so they can give really um, direct and specific advice to students depending on the schools that they're aiming for. Um, and we use this curriculum, again, to help our students and also to train and manage our counseling team from our former admissions officers to our graduate coaches. And lastly, before we get started, we've had a really exciting um, result season. A bunch of results have just come in for 2020. They're still coming in. So just to share a few of our exciting results of our students and counselors, we have 57 Ivy League acceptances, uh, 67 top 10, and 88 or 888, sorry, top 100 acceptances, which is very exciting. And we'll talk about this more a little bit later because we just love to brag about our amazing students. So now, Erica, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so here's our agenda for this evening. We've gone through our introductions, um, but we're gonna have three sections to this presentation. First, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, just generally how applications are processed. Um, 
and will the application process be impacted at all um, by COVID-19. Um, then we're going to talk about some remote project ideas and resources for students to use. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about awards uh, that you can work on or apply to from home. Okay, so how are applications processed? I think this is a really nice graphic here that'll give you a real quick understanding of what happens in the majority of admissions offices. Um, once you submit your application, um, all applications, you know, come in, there's a, you know, a pile of thousands of applications. Of course, it's online these days, um, but their applications are then separated, usually by geographic region, and each admissions officer then gets a pile of applications that they're responsible for. Um, that admissions officer then reads and reviews the application and selects the, the students that they like the best um, to advocate for in committee. Um, and the committee, you know, it's often chaired by a dean of admissions, um, and that's really where the decision is, you know, whether they're going to admit, deny, waitlist, or defer um, a candidate. Um, but it's really essential, the second to last step where the admissions officer is reviewing um, applications, that's really where you want to stand out, um, because if you don't stand out at that phase, you're not going to be discussed in committee, and then obviously you won't be um, you know, talked about in committee. So it's really important to stand out um, in that phase of the process. Um, here's one of our colleagues, Susan Shiflett from Yale, who, you know, has, has weighed in on how she thinks applications, you know, will be processed, you know, differently, if, if any differently, um, you know, due to COVID-19. And, you know, the, the kind of answer is, you know, that instead of seeing this time as a barrier, she really sees this as a, a chance to level the playing field, a chance for students to be more creative um, and more independent students to shine. Um, and that's really what admissions officers have always looked for. You know, whether it's during this pandemic or not, admissions officers are really looking for those students um, who, as Susan puts it, has, you know, paved a new path um, for themselves. Okay. So it will, I, I would say overall, I do not think the coronavirus is going to impact the way in which applications are, are processed by admissions officers. Um, the majority of uh, admissions offices in the United States, they do a holistic review. Um, they're looking at many, many things, not just testing, not just number, the numbers on a transcript, but activities and leadership and commitment to community. They're looking at a lot of different things, and that's that's not going to change um, because of this pandemic. Um, submitting an application itself, that's still going to be the same because um, it's all done online through the Common App. Um, for the majority of applications, will be done on a Common App, and you'll use a portal. And then, while admissions logistics are unlikely to change, top schools. You know, they may look at who used this time creatively. They may look at who used their resources creatively during this time. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then here we've already started to hear from a lot of universities about how, you know, they're seeing, um, you know, their process, if their process is going to change at all during, uh, because of COVID-19. Um, you know, so for example, Yale, has already assured students that they're still going to continue with their holistic evaluation process. Um, you know, the University of California system has announced that high school classes transitioning to on cl online classes are not going to impact student applications any, any way. Um, and Bucknell has even announced that the acceptance of more students than usual to ensure the school keeps up a high yield rate. So, um, schools are starting to, re to definitely reach out and assure students about any anxieties that they might have, um, you know, with switching to online learning at this time. Um, it's not going to be a problem at all. And then standardized testing policies is another way that colleges, um, colleges have reacted and the College Board has reacted. So, um, the next SAT session that we currently have available is set for June 6th. Um, that may or may not happen. 
Um, and College Board, you know, still has to create new sessions to make up for the canceled March and May sessions. Um, so that's going to be very difficult to navigate. Um, if schools can't reopen this fall, College Board's looking for ways to, still looking for creative ways to ensure that students can still try to take the, the SAT. And likewise, the ACT, they canceled their April um, testing session. They have it currently scheduled for June 13th. Um, we'll see if, if that occurs. Um, um, but they're going to also probably look for other dates to arrange more sessions for testing. Uh, AP exams have definitely changed this year. Um, when I worked in the high school side, I was the AP coordinator and I proctored many three and four hour AP exams um, over the years. So now that it's a, a 45 minute um, online free response exam, that, that's quite a difference. Um, there, the College Board actually did announce test dates this week. So those are all online. Um, everybody's going to be taking their AP exam at the same time, no matter what time zone you're in. Um, everybody's going to take it at once. Um, and they can be taken on any device. You'll have to have the option to write your response by hand and submit um, a photo. So I, I would encourage you if you're, you or, or your student is taking APs, you know, you should, you should look at the College Board's website because they've just updated it within the last um, day or two. And then um, if you're somebody who is in the IB curriculum, um, the IB organization has announced recently that their exams that were to be scheduled April through May are no longer gonna be held. Um, students are going to be awarded their diploma, um, you know, if they complete the required coursework and you know, remain in good academic standing, they'll receive it. And then colleges, colleges are aware of all of these changes. Um, because of all of these changes to testing, a lot of universities have already, you know, kind of proactively gotten ahead of, of you know, the anxiety and I think the stress that's, um, you know, happening to students as their, their testing opportunities are being canceled. And they've said, these universities have, you know, decided either for the next year, the next two years, in some cases, the next three years that they will go um, test optional. Um, so BU, for example, has recently said that they're going to go um, test optional in the upcoming cycle. Tufts has said for the next three years. Um, Case Western was one of the first that would go, said they would go test optional. And, you know, most recently um, and within the last week, the University of California has also eliminated the SAT and ACT requirement for applicants, um, which is amazing. So kind of the big takeaway is you know, college applications are submitted online. Um, you know, admissions offices really will operate as usual. Um, and it's, you know, still gonna be important for an applicant to make a good impression on their admissions officer, especially the one that's assigned to read your file so that he or she can then advocate for you um, in committee. All right, so let's talk a little bit about these remote project ideas and resources that students could be working on right now. Um, so in this section, it's divided into um, five areas. We're gonna first talk about, you know, ongoing extracurriculars, self-directed projects, you know, possible COVID-19 project ideas, um, thinking about summer plans, and then um, online programs and internships. All right, so I, I know a lot of students, you know, participate in clubs, you know, volunteer, they're very committed to their interests and their activities. And so it's a bit disappointing that, you know, those have been canceled for the, the you know, for the year. Um, so it may have stopped its usual operations, but there are still things that I think the, you know, enterprising independent student can do to kind of pursue their interests. Um, or their club or their team's goals, they can still pursue that remotely. Um, so if you're the leader, you can maybe think about a, a specific project or an effort that you can maybe work towards finishing, you know, through an online route um, over the next month or so. Or you can maybe use this potential to start a new club that could run, run some online activities, um, invite others in your school to join, or even invite students from neighboring high schools because, you know, 
kind of location um, location is not a problem. You know, if you're running a club online through um, different different resources like Zoom. Um, so here's some ideas that a student could potentially do to kind of continue their online extracurriculars. Um, I, I have a lot of students who are working on websites or blogs um, at the moment. Um, I have one student who is a food historian and she has a blog and a website and um, now she has a little bit more time and she's you know, updating it on a regular basis. Um, organize a fundraiser for a group with a mission related to yours. Um, I, I have a student currently right now doing, doing a fundraiser. Um, she's interested in medicine and so she's um, fundraising for medical supplies um, for a local university hospital. Um, another idea, you could put together a newsletter, you know, featuring content from different members or, you know, maybe a literary, online literary magazine. Um, for someone interested in literature or creative writing. Um, you can also develop resources for the student body as they tra transition online. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of teachers out there who would be thankful to have maybe some, some, some assistance um, from savvy teens that could help them um, produce different resources because I know a lot of teachers um, are struggling with this really kind of sudden switch over to online teaching. Um, so that could be something you could volunteer for. Um, if you're somebody that's interested in arts or creative writing, you know, working on your portfolio, this would be a great time to do that. Um, and then if you're interested, um, you know, in like a, a particular field, you could have a speaker series, invite a guest lecturer um, through Zoom. That's relatively easy to put together. Um, we're all familiar with Zoom since we're using it right now, but there are other tools that you know students could use to connect club members like Google Hangouts, GroupMe, Slack, Facebook groups, and Skype. Um, and now we're going to move on to self-directed projects. So self-directed projects is you a student taking advantage of resources at home to kind of create a project that they've always wanted to do, but perhaps you know have never just had the time to do it. Um, so, you know, you see the example there, a podcast, perhaps a film, a, you know, creating content for a YouTube channel, um, you know, now might be the time to do so. Um, or even, you know, writing a screenplay, owning your business, really the, the, sky, the sky's the limit, your creativity is really the limit here um, and the resources you have. So here are some examples of some of the things that um, our students are doing right now. You know, if you're interested in writing, you could potentially, you know, self-publish a book that's relatively easy to do these days, even easier um, starting a blog. Um, there's so many easy um, platforms out there to, to kind of share your thoughts um, with the world. Um, if you're interested in computer science, you could code, create an app. Um, if you're curious about finance, <laughs> you start investing. I'm not sure about right now whether you want to <laughs> whether you want to <laughs> invest. It might not be the best time to do that one. Um, if you're interested in a business, starting one right now might be a little difficult, but potentially possible. Um, it, art, definitely working on a portfolio is easy to do right now. And if you love a movie, you know, making making a film um, now there'll be lots of time to make the film, edit it, etc. All right, here's more examples. Um, starting a magazine, definitely easy to do um, an online version of a magazine to invite others um, to write or be a guest writer for your magazine. Um, that's definitely something that can be easily translated to an online project. Um, in a series of portraits featuring family members. This is actually one that one of my, my students is doing. Um, right now for her portfolio. Um, she loves portrait work, but she's never actually um, really, you know, done a portrait of somebody in her family. So she's focusing on that now. Um, robotics, if you have the resources, you know, or you could potentially put something together there. Um, you know, composing a song if you're a musician, if you're a historian, maybe starting a genealogy research project um, would be a good thing to do. Um, I know a lot of students do um, 
you know, tutoring in school, um, or they're like teacher's assistants in school that, tu that tutor others. Um, it's fairly easy to do that online as well. Um, you know, using Skype or different tools, you can, you can work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and poems, you know, if you're somebody that's into literature, comparative literature, foreign language, you know, translating poems from one language to the other, um, that would be, that could be something to spend your time on right now and do a literary comparison. Um, so here's kind of the pros and co uh, pros of like why a self-directed project is a good idea um, wh and when it's not a good idea. Um, you know, one, it shows initiative. I think it shows intellectual curiosity to come up with your own idea, your own plan, to see it through. I think it shows a lot of great personal qualities about the student. Um, you know, it allows you to dive deeper into your interests than what you might get just from, you know, your high school classroom. Um, you could potentially use this time to also explore new passions, new interests, if you haven't had time for, you know, now might be the time. Um, and you can develop a project that really is tailored to your passions. You know, sometimes if you're working on a project in school and you're, you have a number of partners or you have a team, sometimes you have to compromise uh, on what, you know, the topic might be. Um, you know, if you're at home and you're starting a project on your own, you wouldn't have to do that. It could potentially be something, you know, unique that stands out in your application if it's strong enough. And then, you know, lastly, you know, this is similar to what I said at the beginning of this column is, you know, it, it will demonstrate a lot of skills, leadership skills, perhaps collaboration skills, organization skills to take on something like this. Um, it's not a good idea to do a self-directed project if, you know, you don't have anything that you're excited about or passionate about. Um, you probably won't go very far and probably won't su succeed um, if that's the case. Um, if you don't have a plan, if you're not an organized um, you know, student, or maybe if you're, um, you have t trouble thinking about like the next step, um, you know, it could be difficult then to implement a project and succeed. And then, you know, depending on resources, you have to think about and evaluate the resources that you have and think about, um, you know, will they support your plan or not? And what can you do, you know, what is realistic to do with the resources you have? And I think ultimately that's, that's really all colleges expect of you is to do the most you can, do the best you can with the resources that you have. Right, and like you said, colleges are definitely gonna be understanding the, the circumstances students are in. But like you said earlier, this is something that colleges have always loved to see. It's just now that students might have some extra time, which is great. Um, I have some students that are focusing their project on um, COVID-19. You know, it's what everybody's talking about. It's on everyone's mind. It's what's at the top of the news cycle. Um, and, you know, like this slide says, it is really an unprecedented, um, really an unprecedented time in our history. So um, students are, are definitely kind of interested in digging a little deeper about it. Um, and, you know, depending on your interest, you can organize projects that respond to the pandemic. I think it should definitely be, um, you know, organic and related to your interest. And we'll give you some examples um, of what we mean by that in just a moment. And then you can combine your research with making a creative project and present your, find your findings in a unique form. Um, it doesn't always have to be, you know, a research paper. Um, or a blog, it could be a video, it could be an online presentation, a comic, um, you know, the, the product itself doesn't have to just be kind of a, a written paper necessarily. So here's examples of, you know, students' areas of interest and, way, and ways that some of our students, um, you know, we're helping our students develop different projects. Um, so, um, you know, some students that think that their potential career path lies in journalism, you know, they could potentially right now analyze different sources of inter information, different media sources um, to, you know, separate rumor from fact about um, COVID-19. 
Um, they could also explore the value of high quality journalism in the face of a crisis. Um, you know, likewise, here's some public policy examples that students could do, research how emergency protocols have been developed, um, compare policy in response to COVID-19 across different countries. Um, I have a student who's doing something like that for her blog. She's interested in international relations. Um, or I have another student, she's interested in psychology and she's really interested <laughs> in the psychology of panic buying. And so she's, she, she's researching that um, and wants to do kind of a short online presentation for her peers on that. Um, so yeah, it definitely, you know, depending on your area of interest, I think there's lots of different ways that you can, you know, look at this pandemic through um, these, these lenses. You know, science and medicine, obviously, there's lots of different ways you could look at, um, look at the pandemic. Um, you could explore how the medical field has reacted to the pandemic's outbreaks now and in the past, compare and contrast COVID-19 um, with SARS. You know, if you're an artist, you could look at the impact of music and the arts during times of crisis. Um, examine similarities and differences between responses to the coronavirus and the situation in, in different films um, that relate to pandemics. There's, there's lots of different things. Um, computer science, I know a lot of students that are interested in programming are doing some different types of tracking apps um, that are released while people are in quarantine and know what they're used for, or you know, just creating apps or programs that help people document coronavirus cases in their area. Um, if you're interested in environmental science, you could analyze the environmental effects of coronavirus and the international response, or the, the types of environments necessary for a disease to become an, and a pandemic, um, or even examine how people react to pandemics versus something, you know, quite serious like climate change. All right, um, summer plans, true or false? If summer programs are canceled, it would be strategic to devote the entirety of your break to SAT preparation. Uh, any thoughts there? I'm not sure if you can use maybe the chat function for that. Yeah, if everyone wants to kind of put true or false in the chat box, we can see what everyone thinks. All right, we've got a false. Okay, getting some answers in, nice. A lot of false, everyone seems okay. to be agreed. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yes, uh, sure, um, preparing for the SAT, that's important. Um, but a strong score in the past, the strong score is not gonna necessarily help you stand out in the admissions process. It's not gonna, it's not gonna help you out next year either, as a lot of universities are, are going test optional. Um, so really, I think, you know, to work on applications, you should practice on your reflective writing, conduct school research over the summer, but you also need to spend some time, you know, thinking about, you know, projects, activities, um, you know, developing personal qualities and skills that are going to be um, admired by admissions committees. Right, especially since schools are going test optional, admissions officers are going to be looking at the rest of students' applications even more. So focusing on your activities and your writing is even more important now than ever that schools are looking less this year at those standardized tests. Okay, so creating alternate summer plans. Um, you know, I know students register for summer programs or summer camps. Um, and you know, summer opportunities, uh, you, may, you may have already heard from a summer camp that you're involved in, they might be making an effort to go remote. Um, so you may still be able to, to follow through with that, that previous plan you've had. Um, so like here's an example, the Stanford Humanities Institute, they've already announced that they're transitioning to online classes. Um, so, you know, you'll still be, you know, if you're accepted to that program, you'll still be, you know, taught by Stanford professors, it'll just be online. Um, Columbia as well, the Columbia Summer Immersion Program has also started to notify students that it will be conducted online. Um, but if your plan gets disrupted, there are still things you could do to have a productive and interesting summer. Um, so some recommendations that we have are looking for online internships, taking online classes at a college, 
starting a remote initiative that peers can join or teaching yourself a new skill on the side. You know, maybe you wanted to learn to code, maybe you wanted to, you know, take up a, another foreign language. Um, that's a possible summer project. All right, online programs and internships. So, um, oh, wait, have we skipped a slide? Okay, so we'll talk about um, universities that offer online classes, I guess. So um, here's a list of, of universities that have always offered the opportunity to allow students to participate remotely. Um, some are some of these are created because of the current circumstance, but a lot of these universities have, you know, traditionally offered an online uh, course during their summer term as well. Um, so you can look through their course catalog to see if anything there interests you. Um, here's some online resources that um, I've used a lot of these with my students when they're kind of seeking opportunities in their their area. Um, they could look at internships.com, um, you know, and they have virtual selections for students looking for remote opportunities. Um, Youth Serving America, um, uh, apparently it has a section on their website now for students that want to volunteer remotely during COVID-19. Um, the National Science Foundation, if you're a STEM candidate, you might be interested in seeking a remote research assistantship through this group or volunteermatch.org. Um, this website features a filter that allows you to search for online opportunities. I, I've had a lot of um, success with volunteermatch.org for my students in the past. They were able to find um, volunteer opportunities in their area that they were interested in um, quite easily. Um, but yeah, there might be some online opportunities this year to look at um, through through that organization. Yeah, I think a lot more um, people and companies will be coming out with remote options as time goes on. Um, Weed and Genius Prep have also been working on expanding our offerings. So like I said earlier, I want to spend a bit of time talking about our academic mentorships. I'm going to go through these quickly and just kind of go over them. But if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me if you're interested in any of these offerings. Um, so we've always offered our academic mentorship um, program, but we're working on expanding how many classes we're offering this spring and over the summer. So our academic mentorship is a program where students can work virtually in classes with professors or scholars or researchers, like the ones I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so these students work in an area of interest um, and they do research and they end up coming out of the project with their own original project, whether this is a research paper or a poster presentation, um, they always come out of it with a really tangible achievement that will look great, you know, on an activities list and helps them, if nothing else, just really dive deep into something they're interested in and gain even more knowledge on a higher education level. So just to go over a few of the courses we're offering soon. So in the third week of April, we'll be starting our online course on the psychology of learning. Uh, this will be taught by Robert Clark, who is a professor at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. Um, so this is um, really topical. They're gonna to be talking about how students learn in online learning, how students' brains work. Um, so great for any students um, interested in psychology. We also are offering in late May, a class called the role of social media during the international crisis or during an international crisis um, taught by Colin Agar from University of Minnesota and Yale. Um, so also really timely and something I know when I was in high school, I would have loved to learn about more communication centered um, topics from a university level. And we also have our leadership program that we put on periodically. We'll be putting on a session this summer. Uh, so this is put on by a member of our leadership team, a leadership expert. Um, it works for, with students who are interested in leadership, a lot of students who are interested in business. So it helps students build up their leadership skills and work on tangible projects. Again, whether that's starting a business, starting a club, running a fundraiser, um, a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about today, they get help from a leadership expert on how to do those. 
So really the takeaway here is that extracurriculars, you know, it's really unfortunate, like we've been talking about that so much has been canceled, but we've also talked a lot about these great online resources that colleges are putting out that other websites are offering that we're offering. Um, and these can allow you to really take any free time that you now have to explore the interests you have and gain really tangible achievements and do some really awesome things with your time. Okay, um, so we're going to move on then to our last section, ways to continue working towards awards from home. Okay, so, you know, uh, the way that I would frame, you know, working towards awards, I would not necessarily say that like that, that I would give the advice to my student, like you must work towards awards right now, but there are a lot of organizations out there that do have online, um, you know, competitions that maybe a student did not necessarily have the time to do, um, you know, when they're in school and they're running to practice and they're running to club or they're running to a job. And, you know, they may not have had the time to do some of these things. Um, and then also, there may also be some awards out there that kind of based on your academics or the amount of service that you've done, maybe you already qualified them and it's just a matter of taking the time to fill out the application or get recommendations, um, you know, to apply for the award. Um, so I would say one thing that a student can do when they're not in class or they're not doing homework right now, they could look up on how you can qualify for um, some of these awards that we're going to talk about. And, you know, just a caveat that some of them, you know, do require excellence in academics. Um, just some tips, you definitely want to fully read the requirements and qualifications for the award before you apply. Um, some of them have applications and you don't want to waste your time on something um, that you don't meet all the requirements for. Um, you also want to look at the deadlines um, for submission and registration and make sure that you, you know, have time to work through your application thoroughly and gather all the information that you need, especially if you need a letter of recommendation for a teacher, you want to ask them well in advance. It's not something you can ask the night before. Um, so here are some um, examples. Um, Scholastic Art and Writing Award. Um, this is open to students in 7th through 12th grade in U.S. schools in Canada. Um, it Currently, um, you could be working on, you know, if you're an artist or a creative writer, you could be working for next year's awards. You know, typically, um, you submit your work in December or January, um, but you could get ahead right now and really focus on, you know, putting together some key pieces that you think might, you know, make you stand out in these fields. Um, one that's going on now is the New York Times editorial contest. Um, I believe that it has extended its deadline to, um, to April 21st. And it's open to you know students in middle and high school um, anywhere in the world and you would submit a 450 word um, editorial piece on a topic that you're interested in and then you know if you're a winner you would have your work published in the new york times learning network um, they also have some additional um, contests that they run throughout the summer there's a podcast contest i believe there's a summer reading um, writing contest as well um, U.S. Presidential Scholars, um, this is an example of what I referred to at the beginning of this section is maybe this is a award that you already qualify for and you just haven't thought about it. Um, but this is open to American high school seniors. Um, it's usually um, an application by in invitation based on your standardized testing scores. Um, there's three categories. There's academic achievement, academic and artistic accomplishment, and academic and career and technical education accomplishment. Um, U.S. Congressional Award. This one's open um, students ages 13 to 24. There's no GPA minimum. You can work at your own pace on this, and there are six levels of awards that require increasing levels of commitment in four areas public service, personal development, physical fitness, and expedition or exploration. And then the last one, the President's Volunteer Service Award. This is for U.S. citizens and residents, um, and it's available to individuals or groups to complete a set number of hours um, within, a given, within a given year from a qualified organization. So that might be an example of something you might already qualify for and just haven't thought about it.
Um, so now we're going to move on to some students, some case studies. This is um, student VX. This is a student from last year. Um, when she came for came to us, this is kind of the work that we did. We call it codifying. Um, we helped her show her passion and interest. She had a strong interest in communication, but there's you know really not anything particularly unique about liking that area. Lots of students do. Um, she had some good leadership experiences at school, but um, you know she didn't really have any experience outside of school or any impact on her community outside of school. Um, so one of the things that we did is, you know, she worked, um, Kayla mentioned the academic mentorship. She worked with Professor Agger and she researched the role and effects of social media in recent elections in the US and South Korea. Um, she then wrote a research paper and then we helped her submit that for publication. And then she uh, really impressed um, Professor Agger and earned a letter of recommendation, which she used in her college process. So how did this help her? I think one, it really, you know, took her interest from just kind of just general communication to something very specific, you know, social media and US and Korean elections. It really kind of shows her intellectual curiosity. Um, it further codified her academic interest in communication. Um, you know, I think the third one is really important. It proved her ability to study and research and work at an undergraduate level. Um, and then, you know, she wrote about this experience in um, some of her essays um, in her application. And then lastly, um, she earned a letter of recommendation. She had something additional um, in her application as a result of this experience. And so here's what Professor Edgar said about her. Um, I mentioned, you know, she, he's pointing out that she asked the right kinds of questions, important skill for anyone in media studies. You know, he's a, an assistant professor, so he's comparing her, you know, essentially with the students that he, you know, teaches. And, you know, he's kind of referring to her, you know, that she's on that same level. And that's, that's always good to hear, um, for sure. And then she did really well. Um, restricted early action, you know, through the early round, she was accepted to Yale, which is great. Um, here's another case study, we'll call her student C. Um, when student C came to us, um, student C didn't really know how to tie together their interests, creative writing and physics, those seem like two completely different disciplines, um, but her counselor worked with her through, um, through interest exploration and recommended that her creative writing and STEM interests could be brought together through writing science fiction pieces. Um, so they worked together um, editing and putting together a collection of poetry and short stories and submitted all of that work for publication. Um, and so here's just some examples of communication with her counselor where, you know, her, her counselor's providing, you know, different feedback on, on her writing, um, you know, or introducing her to um, a contact. Um, and then here's another, you know, examples of the magazines that this student published in, the Apprehension Magazine. Um, and the, the student also created their own website and writing portfolio. And the student C did really well also and was accepted to Johns Hopkins Early Decision. So uh, while colleges understand the current circumstances are rough, they do will still, you know, expect excellence in your, you know, area of interest. And um, while social distancing, you can look for awards and honors um, as well that you could pursue to kind of strengthen your application as a whole. Yeah, so we're really excited about students like student C and VX who got into those amazing schools. And like I said earlier, some results have just been coming in. I'm sure some of your classmates or other students you know have gotten some really excited results recently. So we just wanted to brag a bit about ours because we're so proud of our counselors like Erica and our students for all of their hard work they've been doing. So this year we had five students into Princeton, uh, five into UChicago, eight into UPenn, which is really exciting. Um, we had two students into Brown, uh, 29 students into UCLA, 
Um, someone just said 13 into Duke. Yes, we are so excited about that. And my personal favorite, 22 into the University of Michigan, my alma mater, which I was very excited about. Um, we had 10 into Georgia Tech, 19 into NYU, uh, and 20 into Boston University, just to name a few. So we are so excited for all those students and more results are coming in every day, which we're so excited about. Um, so these students earn these um, achievements through obviously their hard work and the help of their counselors with programs like these. So I'll just quickly go through these. Um, we have our candidacy building program, which starts as early as freshman year where students work with two counselors, our former admissions officers and our graduate coaches to really build up that profile. Um, and do things like we talked about today, like starting independent projects, getting set up with an academic mentorship. Those are things that our counselors really work with younger students on. Um, again, those academic mentorships that we've been talking about. We have a writing class as well um, that can start in freshman year, really great for international students, especially students can improve their reading and writing with um, Ivy League teaching fellows or writing instructors. We have our guaranteed internship that can start in junior year. Uh, we have a big network um, of Inc. 5000 companies that we're connected with, and we help students get internships there to get really hands-on work experience. And of course, then we have our application counseling, which starts the summer before senior year. Um, that's what results in all of these amazing acceptances where they work with uh, former admissions officers and graduate coaches, really starting from ground zero starting from scratch, working on building those applications. So we're gonna start our Q&A. Um, if anyone has any specific questions, if we aren't able to get to your questions, here's my email. Uh, you can email me there. Um, but if everyone wants to start putting their questions in the chat box, then we can ask Erica a few before we go. So if anyone has anything they want to ask, I think I saw earlier someone asked Erica, um, you know, when is it most beneficial for students to be starting independent projects like this? And, you know, how important is it for students um, to have this project linked to their area of interest? Oh, I think you're might be muted, Erica. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, I'll start with the second half of the question first. I think it's, you know, extremely important for it to be linked to your area of interest. You know, um, you don't want to, uh, you know, appear that you're you know, just inventing, <laughs> inventing a new interest, especially if you're a, a junior and this is right before you apply, um, you, you might not want to necessarily invent a whole nother interest or activity. So, you know, if, if you already have some interests like international relations and debate, um, doing projects that kind of, you know, bring those themes together um, would make more sense to, to an admissions officer than starting something completely new. However, if you are a younger student, like a ninth grader, um, and you're not really sure about your interests, starting something, uh, starting something new to explore it and figure out, um, to figure out if you truly are interested, you know, that would, that would be okay, because, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of time to kind of figure out um, what you like and what you don't like, and you could really use this time um, to your advantage. As far as, um, you know, if you're trying to start new projects during social distancing, which would be the most beneficial to start, as far as colleges would like to see, um, there's no, I would say there's, there's no, um, one thing that that we could say say that colleges like better than than the others um i think that would kind of be you know more individualized based on maybe some of the things that you've already done a counselor could give you some advice on you know how you could push yourself a bit or maybe what's you know kind of missing in your activities or what stood out what might stand out to an admissions officer as far as what's missing um in an activities list you could get that kind of advice um, on the counselor for sure yeah definitely uh, another question i'm seeing that i know we've gotten from a lot of our students as well is with high school some of them going pass fail for this semester um, do you think this will be a disadvantage compared to high schools who will be keeping letter grades um no not at all um you know 
every high school, <laughs> any high school can have very different grading scales, um, very different rigors of curriculum. You know, some high schools are known for tough graders, other, others, you know, might not be as rigorous, but an admissions officer knows the context of your school. They know what's going on there academically and they're kind of comparing you to other students within your school. So it doesn't matter if your neighboring high school is still, you know, producing letter grades or number grades and yours is going to pass fail. They're gonna just look at you in the context of your, your school. Um, I, I don't see that being a problem at all. Right, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, let me see. Oh, I think this is a great question. If you have any tips specific to Brown, since you are a former admissions officer from there. Um, yeah, so I think Brown, you know, is known for the open curriculum. You don't have to um, take any kind of prescribed classes. You have the opportunity to explore. Um, so they really want to see students that are going to do that in a unique way that's going to have a unique combination of of interest. So um, the example that we gave you earlier about the student that like creative writing um, and science, like creative writing and physics, you might not naturally think that those two go together, but um, I know the student went, into, <laughs> went to Johns Hopkins, but I could also see them being a strong candidate for Brown with kind of two completely different types of interests that they were able to bring together and make sense of. I think that those types of students you know, that really show that they would use the open curriculum in a unique way um, and to do a bit better in the admissions process there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see, I saw another good one. I saw someone asking, so we've been talking obviously a lot about extracurriculars today, um, but this person is asking how important extracurriculars are or maybe the activities list is compared to personal essays, which I'm sure students could also begin thinking about and writing during this time if they have some extra time. Um, I, I always consider the activities list to be just as impor important as, you know, say the personal statement or the supplemental essays. You know, there's so much information that you can learn about a student through the activities list, you know, not only their academic interests, but really you can see a lot about personal qualities, you can see a lot about leadership um, abilities or collaboration abilities with others. You can see um, like whether they've been, you know, committed to like long-term commitment to something through the activities list. There's a lot that an admissions officer can glean from that activities list. And I think a lot of students don't take it as seriously as the essays. Um, and they really should because if you add up the amount of writing that you would do for all 10 activities, it is just about the same amount of writing as um, a personal statement. So there's quite a bit of information there um, that I think most admissions officers really do value that part of the application um, and spend, you know, I, I know, I, I know saying like a minute or two seems like a short amount of time to spend on something, but they're looking at that part of the application quite carefully. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think this might be the last question I ask you before we go, but um, for admissions and acceptance rates in the fall, do you have any thoughts on whether those will be affected just by everything that's happening? Um, you know, I, I, I do think, um, I would say, I think traditionally people had the misconception that like a test optional school isn't as competitive um, or, um, rigorous in some way. And um, I actually think, you know, applying test optional can be, can be a little bit more difficult. And I do think, you know, um, it might encourage more students to apply um, if they know that they're not, you know, kind of hindered by their standardized testing scores. More students may apply and say, you know, I want to be evaluated a little more holistically on you know, my leadership and my activities. And so I think those things, those things could be quite important on this cycle. Um, you know, they perhaps, perhaps admit rates could, could drop. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say, but I, I do think maybe the numbers of admin, or of, you know, the, the numbers of applications could go up overall. Um, yeah, it'd be hard to say.
hard to say. I, I mean, we also have, you know, kind of the economic impact of this pandemic kind of remains to to be seen. And so we'll, we'll see, you know, how that, um, I guess, how that applies to, to students. Will students apply to as many colleges because of it? Um, will students apply to colleges further away from home? I'm not, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, definitely. I know just speaking for this year's results, we recently had an article come out analyzing them and it looks like some admissions rates went a little bit up this year to protect yield, like we talked about earlier. So I think, yeah, it remains to be seen whether that will happen next year. Great. Well, thank you so much, Erica, for joining us. I hope you all um, found some really great information from this webinar. Like I said, if we couldn't get to your questions or if you have more specific questions about the admissions process, about any of our programs, my email is here. Um, so feel, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. I hope nothing digitally went wrong. My computer is being a bit weird during it. So oh, no, 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 on your end. end. That's okay. okay awesome. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you. You're welcome.